morning and welcome to this session which is going to be called What Would Be Lost If There Were No More English Schools, English Language Schools. And um, we've got three uh, panelists that I'll introduce in a minute. I'll just set this up very briefly. Um, one thing that we have come to realize over the years is that um, English speakers in Quebec are certainly not a homogeneous group. We're a very diverse group, but our schools are very diverse too. And lots of examples of that that we could give uh, urban schools, even in spite of Law 101, have got a variety of cultural groups within the schools. And not only cultural groups, but groups with diverse needs, diverse abilities, talents, etc. English language schools in the regions provide a service that's vital to the local community. And they, the services may be provided by other organizations in urban centers, but in rural areas, the school is empty very often. They provide a, a unique service to the many cultural groups they contain. And again, you know, although we've got Law 101, we do have a variety of cultural groups, and we'll be hearing about that in the next few minutes. And I think one of the greatest strengths of English schools, apart from the quality of education, is the, um, the variety of the ways that they respond to the needs, the way they've accommodated the different needs in their, um, in, in their own communities, <coughs> school community. We've got three speakers this morning who are very well suited to talk about these issues and describe the contributions that their schools and their uh, regions make. So from the far west to the far east of Quebec, that is, uh, David McFall is going to be our first speaker. David's sitting in the middle there. He's the principal of Pierre Elliott Trudeau Elementary School in uh, Western Quebec School Board. And I let him describe the key. It's quite unique, I think. Uh, contribution that his school makes to that region. And um, our second speaker was supposed to be uh, Ella um, from the um, Montreal, English Montreal School Board. <coughs> Excuse me, Helen M M Nicolatopoulos. She's been called away on a family emergency, and Craig Alenek is very kindly stepping in to uh, cover Ella's contribution. Uh, Craig is principal in the Outreach Network of Schools of the English Montreal Board, and he has been principal of Marymount and James Lane. Both of them. Correct. Good. And next to me in the far east of the province is Helena Burke. She's the director of CAMI, which is the Council for <coughs> Anglophone Mandolin Islanders. And that again is a very particular uh, community and a particular contribution. Well, thank you very much, Kate. Welcome to the uh, panel session today. As Kate said, my name is David McFall, and I'm a principal of a very large urban elementary school and uh, part of the Western Quebec School Board. I've been very fortunate to be part of this school board for over 22, 23 years. I'm in a unique position to have been a high school principal, high school vice principal, both for seven, eight years, and now an elementary principal at the same school for about nine years. So in terms of understanding the Western Quebec context, I'm well positioned to, to have a perspective that might be different than the Montreal perspective, might be different from the Far East perspective. And uh, I've also been very fortunate in this position to be part of the Community Learning Center CLC network. When we started seven, maybe seven years, six, seven years ago, we were around the 30th school, now there's 86 schools in our, like you did in our, uh, our network. So just having these varied perspectives and opportunities to understand education, English education in Quebec, and then to relate it to, to our own context. So I'll start with our, our humble little school. It was a humble little school when I, when I took over about nine years ago. And we had a population of 290 students. And the, the building was a former high school, Hull High or Hull Secondary. And then it was an intermediate school, and in the last 15, 16 years, it's been a, an elementary school. And the location is very tongue-in-cheek. I've always said this for many years. I think we're the most unique school in the country. We really are. Well, Madeline Island, Madeline Island's probably 
have some unique characteristics in northern Quebec and other parts of the country, but there are elements or characteristics of our school that you just wouldn't see if you're looking at it through a, a Montreal perspective. Our, our actual building is probably next to two schools in Ottawa, the closest school in the country to Parliament buildings. So we're very close to Parliament. We're maybe 1.5, 1.4 kilometers from the Parliament buildings. So within that area, you have the National Art Gallery, the Museum of History, the War Museum, uh, all within 10 to 20 to 30 minutes of, of walking with students. So in terms of what our students and families and community are exposed to, get experienced in, again, it's different than perhaps other, other schools. But uh, a few other characteristics make us uh, a little unique. As I said, we're part of the uh, Community Learning Center network. And to be able to share with schools from rural areas, from Isle of Montreal to east to north of, of Quebec, and, and learn from one another. And I think that's an important part of the conversations at this uh, conference, is how we share and how we learn from one another, the English-speaking English, English -speaking schools within Quebec. So 290 students sat at the first governing board meeting, and there was this panic, this worry that the school that could host about 450, 500 students would um, would start to be in a decline in enrollment, and as a result, the, the school would, would maybe lose a status, or we would be merged with another school. That's not a problem anymore. We have uh, we've almost doubled. Uh, I see Richard here and his paper, The Decline of English Education, in uh, the 2012 paper. When you look at those statistics and you see the decline of English education from 250,000 to 120, 125,000, and and our school kind of reverses that trend, but again, it's from that in our unique location, that close to Ottawa. So all of a sudden, you have a pool of eligible English-speaking students who have attended school in Ottawa, attended school in Ontario. They cross the bridge. It could be a kilometer to 10 kilometers away, and all of a sudden, they land in, in downtown Hull, downtown Gatineau, and they meet the Bill 101 criteria. It's saying that, that's not necessarily where we're getting our highest number of, of students, but I'll get to that in, in a moment. We are the fastest growing school in our region. We have increased from 30 students to over 100 identified Indigenous students. The families come from northern Quebec, from mostly the Cree communities, Mistisne, Chassabee, um, Wamindji. When the parents come down to the city, they go to school, they go to university, they go to college. Uh, the Career Center, even, even Adult Ed, Sejeps. But they're coming down, the students will come down, the families will come down as well, and tended to settle to, to relocate in the center of Gatineau Center of Hull. And as our school's growing in enrollment, it's growing in understanding our community and our diverse community. So how we organize our school, the approaches that we take are quite unique to ensure that all our students are feeling a sense of <coughs> of comfort and identity within within our school, within our school community, and something else that <laughs> that makes our school a little unique is we uh, we just got a five million dollar investment from the, the, the provincial government and the ministry to build an extension, and on top of that, we just got selected as one of the was seven, now it's six schools in the province to be a Labe Call school. And it, I've been in meetings in Quebec City for the past two months. I had to sit with Chef Ricardo, who's quite a charismatic mm -hmm. character, uh, Pierre Thibault, Pierre, Pierre Lavoie, and to understand the concept of the, of the lab call, of the research, of what they're trying to do in education in Quebec. That if you change the context, change the building, take into consideration the architecture, the nature, the light, the nutrition, the fitness, the need for movement of, of students, and the building of community. If you take that all into consideration when designing a school, how that outcome is going to be different. And I think we were selected because we already had those approaches to understanding healthy child development, to understanding building community, and the vitality of a community. And obviously we have a large indigenous population, and within the Labacol concept, we also want to build a cultural space, a cultural center, because within Gatineau, within the National Capital Region, particularly in, in Quebec, in our area, there isn't a, um, an organization or a place for, for indigenous families, a community, not just a community center, but a cultural 
place that, that people can meet outside of the school. So we can bring that into the school for weekends like we already do, but make it at a much more advanced and much more um, inviting level, then we're, again, very, very fortunate. But the most important part of that is what we can offer our families, our Indigenous families, and then our non-Indigenous families who are going to learn our diverse cultures, learn culture, different cultures of our First Peoples. So a very unique school. Uh, I've been lucky I'm nine years. To sit. You don't get to be principal of a school for nine years, and I absolutely love it. So I'm, I'm just a fortunate person. So why this unprecedented growth? Uh, when we were 290 students, I think we were just tucked away downtown Hull, and nobody knew us. And over the last seven years, by being a community learning centre school, by by our activities, our our community oriented approach to building partners, to building. Um, and building an inviting culture of making people realize the schools not only is a school there or here, but it also welcomes people, <coughs> welcomes our partners, welcomes our families, intergenerational programs, different programs that make people want to belong to the school during the school day, evenings, and weekends. The innovative and progressive approaches of our school and our school board. Western Quebec is very innovative when it's. Um, trying to interpret new, new laws, new policies, and it always, always looks at the very positive side of any new, new bill, new law that comes, comes into effect. And the fact that our urban centre anyway is very closely located, so there's, a, there's a, a great sharing of principles and of the teachers, of the directors, understanding how we embrace the changes within Quebec and how we make that very, um, help them effective for our schools and our school community. We offer a bilingual 50-50 program, which the French schools don't, as we all know. <coughs> the best, I'd say the highest growing um, number of students in our school are the ones that we repatriate from the French system. Many, we've, we've done surveys with parents from kindergarten to grade one of the last three, four years. And we have a high number of students coming from Ontario, from Ottawa. But those families tend to be very transient and quite often go back to, to Ottawa across, the, across one of the bridges. So even though that pull, that source of, of families, those families are there, doesn't necessarily mean they always stay within Quebec. But the number of eligible families, our kindergarten cohorts used to be 40, now they're 80. So it's not just a spike in the birth rate, it's the number of families that are choosing to send their, their children to the English school, to, to the Trino school, instead of the French which is much closer to French local schools. So our school, besides 10 families, they have to take a bus. There's nobody that lives around the actual school besides the 10, the 10 students. So by having more families begin at our school, we keep them. They enjoy the school community, the nature of the, of the, the environment where there is a very welcoming, hospitable ethos within the school to, to, to bring parents in, to bring families in, to enjoy the school community. Obviously it's a place of education for the students, but it's for the experience of the whole family that I think sets us apart from all the other schools, not the English schools, but the French schools in, in our region. That's what the parents consistently tell us, that it's that hospitable, welcoming, warm ethos that they get within our school and the other English schools in our region. And Again, just the proximity to Ottawa, we'll always have families coming because rent and homes are cheaper in Gatineau than they are in Ottawa, substantially cheaper. But one of our um, strengths and uh, characteristics of our school that defines us, it perhaps sets us apart from other schools, is our large Indigenous population. Having over 100 identified Indigenous students, mostly Cree, mostly from as I said before, areas of Mestissini into Chassabi and Mestissini is north of Shibugamu. I just, I'm saying that because I love saying the words, the name is <laughs> north of Shibugamu. And I went there last year just to visit the regions, the, uh, the communities in northern Quebec. I went with a teacher and a family. They invited us up. And to actually drive the 10, 12 hours to go up to Mestissini, to go through the communities where our students are from, and to get to understand where they're coming from and to talk to families within the community. I got to be on the local, with Lloyd, the, uh, the DJ, on the local radio channel. We went to a restaurant that night, and it was like a celebrity. You're the, you remember the guy who was on the radio today? And a fascinating experience. But within the school, we want to make sure we celebrate cultures. 
But we definitely want to make sure we celebrate our indigenous cultures. And through dance, through music, through uh, beating, whatever activities we can offer during the school day, in the evenings, on the weekends, that get our families connected to the school. That they're connected to the school and feel a sense of belonging within the school, within the school community. <coughs> They're going to enjoy the experience of school. It's going to help the families, not just the students. And we're starting to see more families return when they come back from the north, and some stay more permanently. But it is hard for the students because students that have been in the urban setting for more than two or three years, they don't necessarily fit in when they go back home in the summertime. And they may not fit in in the school unless the school's going to do something different. So we have an annual powwow. This year we're going to have our fourth powwow. And the Minister for Indigenous Affairs phones me up to uh, ask if she can attend and, and give some opening remarks at our, our powwows. Obviously our location, where minutes she can get to our school, open up the uh, powwow and then head back for question period on a, on a Friday, which she's done the last two years. So obviously our location is just unique. But to be able to have anywhere from 40 to 80 adult dancers in full regalia with two drum groups and students, indigenous and the best part is non-indigenous students who practice through the year or after, after school evening and uh, dancing nights with parents and kids and get to dance, some of them their first powwow in our school. And get to do that and I heard the best quote at our first powwow, a little grade two boy and one of his classmates was in full regalia dancing. And I just, I overheard him say to another student in his class, oh, I wish I was indigenous. I wish I was, his words were, I wish I was First Nations. And we're, when we talk about reconciliation, we talk about the education system, this is where it's going to happen, in elementary schools. We have to start at the elementary schools. Our kids, our parents have to be exposed and educated to, to our cultures. And if we don't do that, we don't make that uh, an imperative within our school system, we're missing out on the opportunity and the richness that the different cultures in, within our schools uh, provide us with. So yeah, some of the projects, the hand drum, uh, teaching the students how to drum within actual lessons within our class, apply for certain grants for the hand drums, kids making the hand drums and then playing them in the class and playing them in assemblies, and it's just building an engagement and an excitement within the learning and obviously just the, the richness of, the, of the, our cultures. Two minutes, maybe. Two minutes, okay. It's, and uh, I think it's our favorite term within the school. It's innovation in education for reconciliation. And we've worked with, uh, alongside Cindy Blackstock for about seven years through the Project of Hearts, through Shannon's Dream, um, understanding and equitable, for our students understanding and equitable funding in education for First Nation students understanding the uh, residential school system and how it's been neglected in our history books and how our kids have learned through action by being able to, to walk to, to Parliament side by side with, with um, our indigenous community and, and, and educators within our community and go to Parliament on Have a Heart Day on February 14th and talk about this collective action for change within our community. When students get to not only participate in these kind of, it's not using politics, it's still activism, but it's citizenship. It's understanding of what, how students can have a voice. But then when students start to learn more about our history, our true history, and then get to teach other students, get to teach other schools, get to teach, they've gone to government offices and taught adults. So by participating in this form of education, again, it's deep, it's rich, and I think this is where true reconciliation will start to occur in, in our schools. So I'm probably down to the, the last minute. I have a couple of quotes from parents. One, a non-indigenous grandmother who attended the, um, our first powwow and was just in awe. She'd never been to a powwow. To see the adult dancers and student dancers and the, the way the um, moderator facilitator of the powwow was able to describe the different dances and educate people throughout the day. She just thought, what a great educational experience for all, for the entire community. And for one of our indigenous mother's parents who's come from the north, and say she was afraid when she left the north <coughs> that her children would lose their language, lose their culture. And then she'd find our school, and her, her, her children are thriving, thriving in our, our school setting, 
because they're, they're able to share their culture, to teach, to learn, and again, a richness that they have within their school ex educational experience that perhaps they couldn't have got somewhere else. So I think I got in there in 15 minutes, Kate. I could have probably gone <coughs> on a little bit, a little bit longer. Thank you. Thank you could have much. talked all day, actually. Sorry. Did you notice that? Yes. Did you have more pride in it? This is just some of our students here, and Director General Mike DeBow in, in the middle, and the Vice Principal John George, George Addis and myself. But it's the kids. The, the, the excitement's already started by this year's powwow on May 30, 31st. And it builds. Um, not just for, again, it's not just for our indigenous students, it's for our entire community and what they can learn about culture, about a powwow, about the celebration and the music, is transcends what could ever be taught within a classroom. <laughs>
uh, success for all programs, but to name a few of these. If we look in terms of student retention, I'm going to be citing the example of a few different schools. Now, when we talk about English school boards supporting retention for our students, that's another key function in terms of supporting what I see to be our Anglophone youth to operate and function fully within a minority cultural environment as we do here in Quebec. So, in reference to a couple of these schools, first I'm going to profile James Lynn uh, High School. Now, the picture appears on my screen, but it doesn't appear up there. It's simply a picture of the exterior facade, but what's unique about James Lynn High School is how they try to broach and support the whole issue of student engagement and improved success rates. James Lynn High School has been a school traditionally, at least in recent times, that has struggled in terms of perception management, uh, how people view the school, and so forth. Click again. Uh, Click again? Okay. Look at that. I'm learning something here today. Um, in terms of trying to navigate and um, make themselves as relevant as possible in terms of the benefit of the school as well as for the Anglophone community, they've undertaken some very interesting projects. One of which, most notably, is they're the first school to pioneer the uh, urban arts program. And what's innovative about this is the fact that they partner not only school with community, but also with uh, university as well as private enterprise. It's also innovative in the sense that they undertake several different measures and programs to really try to engage students. They uh, have a recording studio, they have an art gallery, which was a first for me, they have their own t-shirt printing um, facilities. And what I find fascinating about that is they actually produce all of their own school uniforms. So really, it's a microcosm for being able to leverage that in terms of applying practical business sense and knowledge. If we further talk about student retention and the roles the English boards play, okay, I'm moving on to the next one. It's all good. There's just a picture of the recording studio. It's, uh, it's obviously copied after our uh, famous Metro cards that have now been taken offline. <coughs> and there's just one of the projects whereby they have artists in the neighborhood collaborate actually with teachers for the disbursement of the curriculum uh, and the programming. So it's a very, very unique program really student-centered and innovative and all designed to support the needs of our students. I'll speak very briefly in terms of the Alternative Schools Network, which is currently what I oversee. It's essentially a collection of 11 smaller schools that really service some of the most uh, at-risk and vulnerable students. Within those 11 schools, there are three schools that we consider to be social affairs schools, which are Mountain View, City to Prairie, as well as Elizabeth High. When we talk about social affairs schools, Essentially, they're partnered up with outside external facilities or facilitators or organizations really with the intent of best supporting our students. So in the case of Mountain View, we're partnered up with Badshaw Youth Protection. With Elizabeth High School, we're partnered with Elizabeth House. And uh, with City of the Prairie, we're actually, it's a, it's a facility of incarceration and it's partnered with uh, Centre de Jeunesse de Montréal. Elizabeth High, just, uh, you may not be able to see from this picture, it's very, very unique. It's a school that supports uh, teenage mothers and be able to assist them as they continue with their studies and obtain their high school uh, education. Our, some of the behaviors that will come across or, or situations that will come across in terms of talking about student vulnerabilities is we'll come across students uh, who may have psychological disorders, emotional disorders, anxiety can be prevalent, uh, severe trauma. All that to say is all of this can manifest in very severe behaviors. And when we talk about retention, supporting minority cultural vitality and the English education system, being able to support some of these most vulnerable students to be able to assist them in, t in terms of being able to uh, move on towards qualification for them to be able to uh, have some sort of pathway to remain in Quebec as viable members of our minority uh, cultural group, it's very, very important. I'll be profiling just very briefly a couple of these schools. The first one is Focus. Focus is a school that services traditionally grades seven, eight, and nine. Because of the need of the vulnerability of these students, we extended it up, to, up until the age of 21. These are students who may have sustained some sort of severe trauma. Uh, really the way we try to support this is we've created a model known as Refocus. 
It's an attachment-based model in a closed classroom setting. We have a lot of different uh, external supports to really try to uh, build and leverage student attachment to school as well as to the community. There are various uh, therapies that complement the programming that we offer in the school, uh, such as art therapy, drama therapy, which are fairly common. However, uh, the least common therapy that they do offer that I've never heard of before, which I've never partaken in, is actually rat therapy. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about that before, but they actually bring rats into the school. And um, the students seem to benefit from it. All that to say is, um, because of the vulnerability, we now have extended uh, students, instead of departing after grade nine, they are now able to remain until uh, the age of 21. Uh, because of coding, and we have a three-year WOTP uh, pre-work program, just to be able to keep them within the safety and confines of our, our environment and uh, for their benefit. Another program that I wish to profile will be at Mountain View High School. Um, Mountain View, as I mentioned, is run in conjunction with Batshaw. Uh, typically, the student profile will be students who may have been released from um, some sort of youth detention facility. So we have very, very important work to undertake in terms of supporting these students. Uh, we've created directly at that school a program known as The Hill, and it benefits not only Mountain View students, but the larger students within the alternative network who are at risk. So if we're housing the most vulnerable and at-risk students in the alternative network, well, The Hill takes it one step further. Traditionally, if there's a student that we're not able to properly support within an alternative school, rather than them being out for uh, uh, a period of time from the school, which uh, might be significant, we actually house them in our program. So rather than waiting for homebound tutoring, which is the equivalent of only six hours per week, so it's a very detached involvement on the part of the board, uh, we keep them in our school, they're provided with an educator, we have several different supports, and they get upwards of about 15 to 20 hours of support rather than being uh, at home. So that's a second program there. Another program that I just wish to briefly highlight will be... Um, about four minutes, right? Sure, thank you will be, oh, I'm getting good at this, will be what we call the hub. So essentially overriding this collection of 11 different alternative schools, uh, we have a central resource facility that we've created known as the hub. So in addition to academic support, we also partner with different uh, community members to also equip our students with tangible life skills. So again, if we're talking about the relevance of trying to ensure and equip our students as part, as members of the English uh, minority community, with skills, with a subset of abilities to remain part of this community here in Quebec. Well, this is what we try to undertake. So we have uh, a barber shop, a hairdressing salon, bike repair, uh, t-shirt printing facilities. So we have quite a bit to that, uh, to that end. Lastly, I just want to touch on the final parameter that I initially mentioned was uh, community vitality. So there's a couple brief examples that I'll give in terms of community vitality. I wish to cite the example of St. Gabriel School. If any school epitomizes community and school involvement, it truly is St. Gabriel School, which is in Point St. Charles. Very, very unique um, school, such that the community involvement is, is at no other level. Um, I can tell you in my eyes it's a generational school, and what I mean by that is when I was a James Lynn principal about 10 years ago, we had a mother who sat on the governing board. Her daughter, Kayla, was in the school. A couple weeks ago, uh, I was visiting the school because we actually have an alternative school based in that same facility. I see that same mother, and who do I see? This student that was with me at James Lynn, who's there now to pick up her child. So it's a surefire way to make yourself feel older when you see your students <laughs> now with their kids. But it was quite rewarding. But St. Gabe's is very invested in the community, and the community is very invested in St. Gabe's. It is totally uh, interwoven within the fabric. And what I mean by that is there's a community clinic in the neighborhood. It's a health facility that essentially partners with the neighborhood that's directed by the neighborhood in terms of uh, distributing services to the community. There's an action watchdog group, which is really a voice for the, for the neighborhood uh, citizens to be able to have their say, to be able to direct uh, neighborhood affairs and this would also implicate the school in that in terms of being able to be that voice between the home as well as the school. Lastly, St. Gabe's is very lucky in their neighborhood they have a YMCA. There is a path program called Pathways which really uh, undertakes to partner up with grade six students and be able to ensure and supervise that transition to high school. So again, this is an example of in my eyes just how, uh, as I mentioned, interwoven 
the community is with school life and how um, interconnected it truly is. So, you know, if we're talking about the removal of English language schools, it'll definitely have a very, very strong and profound community impact as a result. I also wish just to highlight one last example, and it's a bit of a different angle. This is Marymount Academy International. I know David spoke about school growth. When I was at Marymount Academy International, what we embarked to do as a school was really to, uh, to counter the three-year long-range forecast in terms of student numbers. We were at about 320 students at that point in time. The three-year long-range forecast was calling for us to be around 250 students. As you can appreciate, in a facility that can house approximately 800 students, having a building that's only half full is demoralizing for the student body. There is no vitality, or it's very hard to create that vitality. So really, <coughs> student numbers represent life. Now, what we did was we really tried to be proactive in terms of marketing and strategically positioning our schools, uh, or Marymount for success. There were several different uh, undertaking, undertakings we tried to revamp. And I'm pleased to say that, just as David mentioned, that you're able, he was able to see tangible gains, so were we. And, and a lot of the people that we were able, that were coming to us, in addition to, and I'll talk about it very briefly, in addition to international students, were students or parents whose children qualify for English education, but who chose, who chose to send their children uh, to French sector schools. So we were able to woo that back. All that to say is after about two years, we were up over 400 to about 420 students. So it was quite substantial. But I'm off on a tangent. That's not why I included this slide. When I'm talking about retention, uh, this is a snapshot of our student body or some members of our student body about uh, six or seven years ago. Probably half of these students in this photograph are international students. What's significant about Marymount Academy and many of the different English Montreal school board schools are how we go about trying to support our international students. Many of these students may be here for very short periods of time, uh, but I can tell you that there is a sizable portion that chooses to embed themselves within the English community within Quebec who aspires to remain part of that community, and we do have documented numbers of students who remain with their families as part of the English fabric, or as they identify with English fabric within uh, Quebec. So, just in sum, I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, um, really the relationship between uh, English education, English schools, as well as uh, minority community vitality is, is truly critical. I think um, its reach is very great, one into the other. And truly, if we were to remove English schools, I think it would have a very, very deep reverberation throughout the community. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. My name is Helena Burke. I'm the Executive Director at CAMI, Council for Anglophone Magdalen Islanders, which is the regional association that serves the uh, English minority community of Magdalen Islands. I'm here today to talk about um, our school and our community and how we work together to try to promote community vitality. Our story is a little bit more challenging than the two, uh, the two first presenters we had. Um, I'll start just by giving a little bit of a, an overview of the uh, community demographics. So the uh, English-speaking community of the Magdalen Islands makes up 5.7% of the island's total population. Um, so about a, about a quarter of the English-speaking population is aged 0 to 24 years old, with nearly 60% of the population being aged 45 plus. So we live in a community with uh, a very aging community, and we see the, um, the impacts of that on our school population. When I graduated in 1997, there were about 100 students in the school. Our school serves a, a population of pre-kindergarten until secondary five. And today we have about 45 students, so half the student population uh, when compared to uh, uh, the, the late 90s. Um, income, we have about 28.5% of the total population age 15 and over that are earning less than $20,000 per year compared to 29% in the francophone population, so it's about the same. Um, in, uh, we have about 32.5% of the total English-speaking population that are age 15 plus that is earning more than $50,000 per year, compared to 21.8% in the French-speaking uh, community of the islands. This mostly related to the fact that we are an industry community, a fishing community, 
um, which is doing very well uh, currently, very lucrative business these days. So that will, that is the, uh, this is what explains such a high uh, percentage of anglophones that are earning this much money because we have a large portion of our community are, uh, are fishermen. Um, we make up almost 6% of the population, but more than 25% of the lobster permits owned on the Mango Isles are owned by anglophones. 5% uh, of the total population live in below LICO, low income cutoff. Um, we have 15% of the total English speaking population who are living in lone parent, lone parent families compared to 9% of the front of the community. <coughs> in terms of educational attainment, 62% of the total English-speaking population aged 15 and over hold a high school diploma or less compared to 48.2% of francophones aged 15 plus living in the same region. 38.5% of the English-speaking population aged 25 to 44 holds a high school diploma or less compared to 26.7 francophones. So this is our parent population, um, the 25 to 44 uh, age group. And 61.2% of the population age 45 to 65, same thing, holds a high school diploma or less. So we have um, a population with very high levels of low education, which has, uh, we feel, a large impact on um, the success rates of our students. Unemployment rates in the last census, the 2016 census, when I looked at the unemployment rates, it said 2.5% of the population was unemployed, and I'm like, there's something wrong with that statistic, because the majority of the population is unemployed for the most part of the year. When I spoke to Joanne Pocock, um, we, we, we feel maybe it's because the census took place in May when everybody was working. Uh, in the 2011 <coughs> statistics census data, it was uh, 40, 40% or more, I don't remember the exact number, but it was quite, uh, we have more than 2.5% of the population unemployed for a portion of the year. Um, so what becomes of our of the graduates of the English language school and the French language, French language school? Uh, in the past, our students have more of a tendency to attend post-secondary in the maritime provinces because we have more of a connection to Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and because of its proximity. Uh, more and more, however, we tend to see students coming either to Montreal or going to Lennoxville. And this is because students will tend to flock where um, a Magdalen Island community has already been established, and in more recent years, that's been in Quebec. Um, we have observed that graduates with low levels of French do not return after post-secondary because it's difficult for them to integrate into the labor force. In my cohort of um, my my peers, the people that I went to school with, I'm one of the only uh, one of the only ones that remained. Um, the rest of them are all thriving in other provinces of the country, and largely because they are not able to speak French. Um, We've also um, see graduates who would be considered fluent have a higher tendency to return to the region and integrate into the francophone labor market. So we have a lot of our, our university graduates who have come back to work in the banks or at the hospital. We have like a four, five, six recent graduates that have just been hired by the, the health system. So those that are able to communicate and that are educated, uh, we find more and more that they're coming back and integrating. However, sometimes um, these people, because the way that the community is, is uh, located on the islands, we're in the uh, eastern extremity and the hospital center and everything is located, located in the central island. So a lot of the, these people will then move to the central island. So they're moving out of the community into the francophone community. Their children will likely go to French school for most of their education integrated to the French community, which for me is a little bit um, is a little bit worrisome. Um, we are also no noticing lately that uh, a lot of some being a high school graduate does not necessarily mean that you will leave the islands or that you will uh, go to post second or take post take up post secondary plans. This is a shift from the past where most graduates did uh, move into post-secondary institutions following graduation. My son graduated in June, 
um, with a secondary five diploma, and there were five graduates, and of the five graduates, uh, none of them left. So they've all graduated with a diploma, but they all chose to stay home. However, of, of the graduating class, we had four boys and one girl, and the boys in our region will tend to take to the fishing industry as well. What becomes of the graduates of French language school? Most of them tend to head to Quebec City because, again, they too uh, will head to uh, areas where there's already an existing Magdalene Island population, and most of those are in, in Quebec City. Um, what challenges face the English speaking community of the Magdalene Islands? Uh, we don't have the population required to offer vocational and adult day programs. Um, we still continue to have high dropout rates because of the lure towards the fisheries. As I mentioned earlier, the fisheries is, is a pretty lucrative business right now, and that has, is having a, large, a huge impact on our school success rates and on, on our boys, on the male's population. There's a high dependence on the employment insurance program, and this starts also at an early age with young boys dropping out of school as early as 13 years old. So since April, we've lost four grade nine students who have left school to, um, to go pursue the fisheries, um, which is you know, very sad for us. And we expect to lose at least one more before, before spring, which will mean we've lost half of our grade nine uh, population. Um, with the low levels of bi we have low levels of bi bilingualism and isolation is a challenge. Um, we're isolated both geographically and linguistically, and then even on the islands, we're we're isolated in our own little community, where uh, the community in which we live and where our school is located is completely English speaking. So there's not a lot of exposure to the French language or the French community, which makes uh, things a little bit more challenging. So. <coughs> And historically, we've been a self-sustaining community that never felt the need to learn French or, or to have French because we were able to look after ourselves, so that uh, is also a, a challenge. Making our education programs relevant to students in our setting is challenging. Um, people who want to be fishermen don't necessarily see the value in academic uh, education, so it's trying to find ways to be innovative in making the programs available at the school uh, more culturally or to culturally adapt those. Uh, the population group, this population group has a tendency to remain in the community, have their families and build their houses and things. So that is not a challenge. That is more of a, a good thing that they stay. But because of the low education levels and because of the um, they're not as uh, engaged as we would like. There's not a lot of mobilization Low levels of education in the community tend to have a, have a tendency to be low uh, be, because formal education is not necessary to work in the fisheries. Uh, there are considerable issues in the community concerning nutrition, drug and alcohol dependency, and other health factors because of the low levels of education. And then you have uh, low levels of education with high levels of uh, income. <coughs> You can see where I'm going with that. Um, we are dependent on a single industry, thus considered economically vulnerable. So right now, we're doing very well, but that could change on, on, on a dime. Um, we're a resource industry. Mother Nature controls uh, how many lobsters we're going to fish um, and, and things like that. The aging population I spoke about and the, uh, and the, the decrease in our numbers at alarming rate. Um, so, in 2000, from in 2011, 2012, there were 76 students in total. In 2018, 2019, 45, and projections for 2019, 2020 are set in the 30s. So we continue to see a decline in uh, in the uh, student population. And that's all grade levels. All grade levels from pre-kindergarten to secondary five. Um, how does the English language school support the community? So we are part of the CLC network and we have been since 2011. That has really helped us to get into the schools and uh, to be able to make the links between the community and school. Um, 
the school works very much in collaboration with us, with Candy, and with other community organizations. And that uh, has, the school is, is part of various community strategies aimed at improving health and well-being of the entire English-speaking community. So over the last three or four years, we've been able to develop strategies, uh, one of which we've developed in collaboration with Kathy, with Keza and Kathy, who's here today. She's going to present on this uh, Bright Beginnings, uh, I think it's tomorrow we present. So it's an early childhood development program. We uh, worked with, with Keza to develop a regional, a regional action plan, which we do, we have the regional priorities and we do the local um, actions on the ground. The school has hired the resource through the NEES the special measures and we provide a lot of the materials and the activities. We have a youth health and well-being strategy that we developed in collaboration with the school uh, to try to tackle the drug and alcohol issue uh, that we face in the community. We've developed a senior strategy as well, of which the school has been part of uh, to try to facilitate intergenerational uh, connections. The Community Innovation Project, which is funded by, through the QCGN by ESDC. This is a vocational program that we've developed to try to expose our young boys to uh, the trades program. So if they want to stay in the community and be fishermen, that's fine. We want to try to expose them to other um, career options that would keep them busy in the fall and winter. So like welding or boat building or carpentry or whatever. Uh, we have a municipal family policy and community mobilization strategy. So these are all things that we've developed together as a school, as a community, as a municipality. Um, and this community involvement is possible because of the human resources available uh, within the school via the NES special measures and the Quebec Canada Entente. So this concludes my, uh, Thank you, my so presentation. <laughs> two views from the school and then we've had a view from the community and the collaboration from the three of them is quite obvious and quite evident. That was terrific, thank you. Questions, comments, reactions? Throw it open to the floor. Uh, I couldn't help uh, mentioning regarding, so David at, uh, at Pete's, you said you were the principal there for nine years. And uh, I mean, my, my experience is that often principals get changed that there's more focus on the, on the, the what's going on at the school board level and that the mixing and managing is better. But we know that change is long and hard. And so, like, how much stamina did you, like, did you know you'd be there that long? Did you just say, well, I'll put things in motion and see what happens? Or, like, what, how, how much does it, how much do you attribute the fact that you've been there for so long make a difference? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, if you ever go from the secondary level to the elementary level as a teacher or as an administrator and you're used to walking around the high school and some of the things that you have to, to, to deal with with truancy and, and other areas, and that first day you arrive at an elementary school and the bus, the little door opens and these little guys and girls get off the bus and it was the most shocking experience of my life. I, just, I wasn't ready for it, I wasn't just become a parent, but I just couldn't believe it. Sadly, my first instinct was, how am I going to discipline these little things? <laughs> Which, I, over nine years, what I've learned about healthy child development and um, community building, I, I wouldn't change this experience for anything in the world. But it's, I don't think in any of our jobs we set out for, for a nine-year journey or a ten-year journey. We're really lucky in Western Quebec. It's the excitement of building that community, of 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 of. of um, the directors and the, the school board commissioners allowing and trusting the administrators in the unique schools to stay, to build that vibrant community because we know what we're talking about today is that vitality, vibrancy of our, our schools and English communities. But to have the trust within the administrators who can build the staff and build the community who actually love what they do and want to grow the school. and. Um, it's most likely different in, in, in Montreal because the, the, the schools and communities are, are perhaps very similar. But if you go to Val or, or to Miskaming in, in our school board, 
I'm not going up there. <laughs> I'm not going to be changing schools very, very quickly. So there is certain administrators are are settled in their areas. I I hope I get to stay there another five years and see this Labic Call, or ten years and see this Labic Call project through. But I think it's it's the the trust in our commissioners and directors that allow us to have that stability and continuity that gives us a chance to truly know our community. And maybe there's a point in, in a career where you become stale, but I haven't got there yet. I don't know if it's possible. I don't know if that's answering the question. No, it's more like how would you attribute the fact that you have been there, regardless of the support you've had, but your journey through that, building that school from the 290 up to the close to 500, that do you think that it, that could have actually happened if after year five you did not, you went somewhere else? Would somebody else have been able to continue that momentum? Perhaps, but in, in terms of, of any news, vision or strategy or initiatives it could just take it you're right a different direction and all of a sudden you lose some of the strengths and uniqueness and the, the healthy characteristics of your school and community so yeah I, I definitely agree with what you're saying the continuity has allowed um, the school community to to grow to uh, to where we'll be in the next five years I, I'm, I'm not so sure but it's it's a wonderful journey i just feel very privileged Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Question? Yes. Thank you all three of you for your presentation. That was really interesting. Um, I have a question, perhaps for all three of you, but particularly for David and Craig, about um, one of the things that really comes out, came out in your presentations, is just how implicated your schools are in the community and, and in building these really innovative partnerships um, to meet the needs of your student population. And I'm wondering if you can think of any examples of uh, similar kinds of initiatives that are being undertaken within the French language boards, and maybe within you as well, um, uh, in, in the, the Magdalene Islands. And then I had another question for Hannah. Specifically, you mentioned grade nine boys dropping out. So the first is that there's this gender component that I think is really interesting. Um, but second, aren't they legally required to be in school? They, school? they are legally required to be there until they're 16, but what, what happens is when the reports are made to the DPG, the response that the school administrator gets is, well, they're being fed, they're being clothed, they're, the basic requirements are there, they're not, their lives are not in danger. We have a caseload of, of more um, important, more pressing issues, more pressing needs that we need to address. So it's, um, and then when you're in small communities, like we're, in our community we're 400 people, the islands in general is only 12,000. Sometimes people will try to, um, I would say, duck some of these things because you have to live in these communities or face these people. And so, could does any of this um, great stuff? Do you have any examples of these great initiatives happening in yeah, French? Yeah, so the role of it is, it is what the English community is, or is what the English schools are doing. Is it unique? I guess is what, is what, I'm, what I'm asking. Or is it being done? I'm not totally familiar with the, with the French board. I'm sure there are some really interesting things that are taking place program-wise. I think for each different school slash board milieu, there's a different need that really kind of dictates uh, programming implementation and so forth. Uh, I know they have at the elementary level. Um, here in Montreal, there's a really well-known alternative school, but I use the word, the word alternative different than how we use it perhaps with the English Montreal School Board, which is you know, to really service and support some of the most vulnerable. I think that's just, from what I understand, perhaps a different pathway to exposing children to to education. But I'm not totally familiar, but um, unfortunately. David? Similar to, to Craig, we don't know all the experiences, the programs of our, our uh, French schools within the Uwe region, but consistently dozens and dozens and dozens of meetings with parents I hear the same thing over again. The school is the school. It, it educates. There's a, there's a, there is a school community, which is naturally situated around the school, physical school building. But it's that that ethos, that that um, welcoming invitation of trying a little bit harder to make sure. And I, I don't want to discredit any any school, but these are the conversations I have with English families or allophone families who are looking for something more than a school experience. That a community, a family educational experience, 
And the more you hear, the more you realize we're the little engine going, going up the hill and we have to try harder. We have to do things differently and think differently. And any way that we can bring our families into the, into the fold of, of, of our community and make them feel part of our community. An example would be on Friday mornings, I always open the doors to parents to uh, have a little coffee drop-in morning with, with the principal. I've been doing that for seven years. I come in with my two travelers, so I've upgraded to Starbucks coffee now. Just to be <laughs> some, some people weren't as excited to come. I thought, how do you get more people in? Ditch the, ditch the Timbits and got two travelers of, of coffee. And you said there could be anywhere from five to 20, 25 parents will come in. And just sitting around, listening, talking to parents, enjoying the company, and you get sometimes not only do it diffuse some of the big problems that could come, some of the best ideas are generated around those conversations, through those conversations. Like, oh, that's a great idea. Why don't we think about that? Why don't Why don't we do that? And another couple of today, our families are off on a hike in the, in the Gatnos just to bring community together and enjoy the season. Or we do weekly after school soccer with parents and staff just to bring people together to have fun. One thing we forget about. As, as we grow older, is that we need to play too. So it's good for our kids to be healthy. It's also good for our families to be healthy, <coughs> physically and emotionally. So it's everything you can think of to try to build that experience for all. It's, uh, probably sets us apart in the French schools. Roman, and then uh, Linda. Uh, just to give um, a little bit of uh, light, the English-speaking schools are trying harder because they want to retain their students and they want to get into their dying and they're trying to stay yes. alive. French community doesn't have to worry about that. So the emphasis of, of being welcoming is not necessarily there. So that kind of um, is the background of why we're really doing this. But I think the motivation of reaching out to the communities is, a, is a, a nice circle because what you get back from the community fuels other programs. Yeah. The ideas that we get. Linda? Yeah, sorry. Uh, just following up, I guess, on the previous comment, I have done a lot of work with the French side. I think quite often they also hold on to some very rigid structures and there's not always an openness to having either parents or volunteers playing a role in the community. And sometimes the unions are quite uh, very, very, play a very strong role in blocking that. So that just uh, another aside. You all mentioned the community learning centers in your presentations and that is unique. Yes, to the English-speaking community here. And I, I just wonder if you'd like to elaborate a little bit uh, to what extent having that kind of structure there helps you do what you're doing in terms of your community outreach and community support. Sure. So uh, in our region, having the community learning center is very, very uh, important for us. Before that, we worked with the schools, but not to the same level that we do now. Um, by having the community learning center there, we have somebody in the school who is a direct link between us and the classroom. Um, we also have a very supportive school administrator as well. I think that's been one of the reasons we've been so successful in uh, working so collaboratively <laughs> with the school is because the, the administrator himself is very, uh, very dynamic and very open to um, to doing new things to try to improve student success. So, so. Sometimes I think it also depends on personalities. So just having the right personalities in the right place at the right time, I think, um, has contributed to our success with the Community Learning Center. Can I just uh, get some more comment to Brian and we'll make you the last question. David? It's, <coughs> again, the privilege and fortune to be part of something like a Community Learning Center network. And I think all schools would thrive to, to build communities, partnerships, but not all schools have the opportunity to have a community development agent who is responsible for building the partnerships within the school and outside the school. So I think that just puts us in an advantaged position that other people don't have to have the privilege, but it's, it comes down to wanting to build a community. If you want to build a community, you have the personality, and you want to reach out and embrace and the, the concept, then it can flourish. You're just so lucky. Craig, uh, you Remotely. Uh, James Ling, uh, back, uh, I don't know, maybe eight, nine years ago, back when the initiative first came to us, uh, I would just echo what David said, uh, sentiments were. It, it's a real privilege to try to have a facilitator. We do have a coordinator at James Ling, 
uh, who really tries to who really try to obviously bring in the community uh, through different initiatives. Um, you know, initially because I left shortly after that, uh, there were some initial challenges in terms of trying to leverage the community, but. You know, to this day, it still exists at James Lynn High School, and I think it plays a very key and pivotal role. You know, just by trying to bind any sort of community member to the school. A quick questions? Uh, a comment. Uh, traditionally, sure. English schools have always been much more welcoming to parents. Yes. And uh, in '87, of the English schools in the province, there are home and school associations, and and that federation has existed for 99 years so that uh, I know that the, the ministry was looking at uh, the uh, QFHSA and, and trying to get parents in the French system more involved and, and uh, they were also analyzing what, to what degree the student's success is related to the implication of parents in the learning of their children and not only that sort of the fundraising for extracurricular activities and cultural activities and things like that. And it's a different kind of involvement than the, the proposal that's being floated around yes. for a service yes. center manned yes. by parents. Yes. This is a, a very ground level involvement that you've been talking about. Thank you so much. You know, the, the, we did start off with a question <coughs> which was, what would be lost if there were no more English language schools? Well, I think we've got the answer. Yes. And an awful lot would be lost. And uh, you three good people have demonstrated that nobly and admirably. And uh, I do appreciate what I've learned. Thank you.